I can deal with disagreement. I can deal with people telling me that they don't like what I said and telling me what they believe. One thing that I hate, though, is when people try to tell me what I believe. (laughs) And every time I talk about the rapture, whether it's on this podcast, whether it's on like an online forum somewhere, everyone wants to come in here and tell me that I only believe in the rapture because I follow John Nelson Darby. I couldn't even tell you who John Nelson Darby even is. So when I want to talk about what I believe in the Bible, I go cite the Bible. I give Bible verses. And yet, despite that, time and time again, people tell me that I don't believe the Bible. They tell me I just follow some guy named John Nelson Darby and that I'm just listening to what he said and they want to talk about him. So after hearing this for years, I've decided to finally just investigate who John Nelson Darby is. So was the rapture something that was just made up by this guy named John Nelson Darby in the 1800s? Is it true that the doctrine of the rapture didn't even exist until about 200 years ago? We're going to figure that out today on the Cross References Podcast. Welcome to the Cross References Podcast, where you learn how every small piece of the Bible tells one big story, and most importantly, how they all connect to the cross in Christ. Whether you're a brand new Christian or a veteran Bible reader, our goal is that God's Word will make more sense to you after every episode. This is Luke Taylor. I'm a minister, and I'm also a total nobody. (laughs) I'm just a regular guy. So I don't know why so many of you tune in and listen to me, but hey, I'm glad you're here. Last month, we broke a new record for the podcast. It was the most popular episode we've ever had to date. It was just under 2,000 listeners for just one episode. Um, Before that, I don't think my most popular episode even had 500. So like I I, I did an episode last month, if you didn't listen to it, it's called How Close Could the Rapture Be? And that just sailed up to 1,000 listeners in its first week. It's just still, it's a little under 2,000 now. So that's exciting for me. I spent 10 years as a youth pastor for a small church. We didn't have a, a huge youth group. It was typically 10 to 20 kids in a youth service. And um, I think the most kids I ever had attend a service up to that point uh, in my nine years as a youth pastor was probably about 25. Uh, The lowest I ever had was that only four kids showed up. And yet, despite all that, I just always tried to do my best, whether we were going to have five kids, whether we were going to have 25 kids, I always tried to give 100% to every single service every single message that I did. And that's the mentality that I try to bring to this ep- this podcast too. Um, I always try to do my best with the episodes. I have a blast doing the podcast. You know, even if nobody was listening, even if I had zero listeners, I would probably still do it because I just, this is just so much fun. But um, I want to say though, for all you who did tune in last month and left feedback, that was also, that was very much fun. That was exhilarating and rewarding. And, uh, and it was humbling. You know, it was humbling because I know that I'm nobody special. I'm I'm just an everyday guy who loves Jesus. I love theology. I love prophecy. And I love getting to talk to people about all those things. I love talking about Jesus and theology and prophecy. Sometimes I do a mailbag segment where I can feature some of the things that you all um, give some feedback on. And uh, and I, so I guess after that August episode that did, um, that got so much feedback, uh, I'm wanting to do an episode here where I just respond to the feedback, respond to the comments. And so I'm going to go through a few of those. I had more than 60 responses. I, it's up to about 90 now. Um, I can't respond to everybody, and I wish I could, but I, I'm like I'm at that point. I, I have too much <laughs> with my full-time job and all that. I just can't respond to everybody. But I want to go through what I'm trying to kind of collect what were the most popular responses were and, and respond to those on here. And so thank, I'm very grateful to everybody who took the time to listen especially thankful to those of you who responded with questions and comments. Um, well, as I was saying about being a youth pastor, if I had, you know, five kids, if I had 25 kids, um, I was just trying to do my best. And I never spoke to a room before where there was 2000 people in attendance. You know, I, I never had that. So the, the, but podcasting allows me to do that. And so, Hey, just for everybody who responded, who got back to me and had, feedback, you know, positive, negative, whatever. But I'm just thankful you took the time to listen and and respond. 
that's and that's that's a very uh, that's very kind of you to take the time to do that. So, hey, thanks for all of you. If you haven't listened before, um, go ahead and give us a subscribe and a follow so you can keep up with the latest episodes. And if you have a specific thing you're wanting to see a response to, I've put timestamps in the uh, show notes for today's episode. So you can go look it kind of it's it'll be kind of a table of contents and it'll let you jump right to the part that you want to hear. So if you don't want to hear about something, if you just want to skip to another question, you have the ability to do that as well. Tried to make that <laughs> tried to make it easy for you to skip whatever you don't want to hear to not listen to me. So anyway, let's let's talk about some of these um, listener feedback questions and comments that I got to set the stage. That episode that got so much feedback, I, as I mentioned, it was called how close could the rapture be? And the subtext of the episode was that it might not be as close as you think. One of the reasons that I think that that episode kind of took off, you don't you don't hear this idea presented very often by people who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. If someone's a pre-tribulation rapture believer, typically, and, and I am as well, they're always emphasizing that the rapture is just right around the corner. And so my goal with that episode was just to say, we might need to prepare ourselves to endure a few more hard things before the rapture happens. You know, it, and I always be ready for it because it could be any moment. But also you need to brace yourself. What if the next 10 years on planet Earth get really bad and Jesus doesn't come back for 10 years? You know, we just got to be ready for that possibility as well. Be prepared. Be prepared to go in the rapture, but also be prepared to endure some harder times before Jesus comes back. And those two ideas are not in contradiction. Okay, so we had, you know, we had some feedback here, someone named Ray, and this, I I picked some comments today that represent what a lot of people were saying. Ray says, the rapture will not just happen at any moment, any time, but rather he will come at the appointed time, most likely at the Feast of Trumpets. So when we say that the rapture could happen at any, and I'm, I'm responding to Ray, when we say it could happen at any time, we do all know that God has determined an appointed time for it. You know, I don't think anybody denies that. <laughs> you know, God's not up there just rolling dice. He's not watching an hourglass just waiting for it to run out. God does have a specific day, a specific time in the future where he's going to turn to Jesus and say, hey, it's time. Go get the church. So, yeah, of course, there's an appointed time, but we don't know when that time is. So for us, it could be at any moment. We don't know when the appointed time is. So, again, it's for, for any moment for us. Uh, he also mentioned, actually... Several people mentioned that the Feast of Trumpets could be a, a possible date for the rapture. And to me, I mean, well, I think the Feast of Trumpets, that's a great day for the rapture. Um, but, but I also think today would be a great day for the rapture. So there, there's a theory out there. And I'm not saying it's a silly theory. I, I love the theory, but it's just a theory. It says that the rapture is going to happen at the Feast of Trumpets. And so um, to back up a little bit, whenever you look at the Feast of Israel that are outlined in Leviticus 23... There was a literal fulfillment on the day of the feasts of something that happened like later on. So the feast of Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. These were all annual feasts. They happened on a specific day each year, just like, you know, any holiday on the American calendar. There was a specific day for these feasts, but also they all had something happen in relation to Jesus on the exact day of the feast. Then there were three other feasts that have not seen any fulfillment on the exact calendar day. Those are the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And so there's a lot of speculation about what's going to happen on those dates someday in the future. And I'm, I mean, I'm absolutely certain that those dates were picked for a reason. You know, that something is going to happen on those days, certainly or almost certainly with conjunction with the return of Christ. You know, so I have, I just have no idea what. I just don't know what it's going to be. There's a lot of good ideas out there about that. One idea is that the rapture is going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. And one of the basis, basis for that is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So in talking about the rapture, it mentions the trumpet right there. And I could totally see this, this trumpet being what the Feast of Trumpets is a prophetic picture of. And there's some other things about it, too, that could make it the rapture. So I have no problem with that theory. I have no problem with that interpretation. 
there's an idea out there that the church is going to be raptured on the day of Pentecost. Um, that's based on how the church started on the day of Pentecost, and so some think it'll be raptured on its birthday. I guess there's a Jewish legend about Enoch um, that may or may not be true, but that says he was raptured on his birthday, and Enoch was kind of a type of the church. Um, if When I say a type, I'm going to be doing an episode soon about typology, and so anyway, I don't have a problem with that interpretation either. My theory is that the rapture is not on any particular day. It's just <laughs> it's just going to be on a random day, and you can't predict what day. That's just my theory. My theory is that there is no theory. <laughs> so, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll see someday. I think just always be ready, as I always say. John, uh, John says, uh, and this is another listener feedback, not not the John of the Bible. I, I don't think anyway, but a John who left some feedback. Um, he says the great catastrophe or event that could kick off a lot of these things into reality could be the rapture of the church. He was referring there to where I talked in that episode about there's still a lot of things that need to fall into place for the Antichrist's kingdom to be set up. Um, but one thing I think we've seen the past few years is that when you have a big crisis, some kind of emergency situation that you can use as an excuse, the governments of the world will push a lot of stuff really hard and really fast. And so I think that's what John was referring to, is that one one big catastrophe or crisis that could kick off a lot of the Antichrist kingdom, like kick it into high gear and get it going, the rapture of the church could be that thing. And I certainly agree with that. Um, I was hearing, but I was hearing from someone recently um, who knew, who knows a thing or two about the banking systems and CBDC and all that. That's the central bank digital currency. That's a tool that the Antichrist is, I'm sure he is going to use to try to control the world. And, but I've heard it said recently by someone who knows a lot about this stuff that, um, CBDC probably won't be available for years at the earliest, that it could take years to institute that system. And so I agree, it it probably won't happen overnight. Um, but if there was some kind of emergency crisis, like the rapture, okay, a bunch of people disappearing all at once, that certainly could propel a lot of these ideas forward. So anyway, I agree with you, John, and thanks for that message. Another comment says... Um, here, here's what, This is what the comment tells me. Here's what you said. There are still some people that God would like to see get saved. That was a quote that I made on that episode. And so then this response is saying, that makes God sound kind of wishy-washy. Doesn't sound sovereign, more like he's playing things by ear. God has written every name in the book of life before the foundations of the world. He absolutely knows and has determined everything. And so um, I don't disagree with that comment, but I, I want to clarify a little bit what I meant when I said that God wants to see some people get saved. <laughs> what I meant by that is God is not initiating the rapture of the church until God sees a certain number of people get saved. And I don't know what that number is, um, but there is a number. Romans 11 mentions something called the fullness of the Gentiles. And let me explain what that means. Um, right now, because the Jews rejected Christ, God has turned his attention away from the Jewish people, and God has turned it to the Gentile world. God had, um, as we mentioned, and we talked about this on episode 50, God had a 490-year plan for Israel, and that's, that's the episode where I talk about the 70 weeks prophecy, if you want to find out more about that. When the Jewish people killed Jesus, God hit pause on his 490-year plan, and there were still seven years to go in that plan. So 483 years had passed, then the Jews killed Jesus, so God paused his plan for Israel. There are still seven years left in that plan. That is the seven-year uh, tribulation. And so it, during the pause, in the meantime, God has turned his attention to the Gentile world. And so it's that's why we call this the church age. Um, right now, the majority of people becoming believers, getting saved, are Gentiles. Only like 1% of Jewish people, I've heard this said multiple times, only about 1% of Jewish people in the world are Christians. They're called, we call them Messianic Jews, only about 1%. So right now, the Jewish people, even though the Bible was given to them, the Messiah was given through them, but this is not, it's, it's kind of a strange thing. It's like there's, well, the Bible says there's a hardening that's been put on their hearts. Uh, well, well, let me just read that verse. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. Paul said, lest you be wise in your own sight, 
I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So right now there's a partial hardening on the Gentiles. And that just means, I'm sorry, a partial hardening on the Jews, on Israel, Israelites. And so there's a partial hardening on them. And that means Gentile people are just more open to the gospel. Um, but that that time period that where it's the times of the Gentiles, we might say, um, the time for them to get saved, that time period is uh, going to run out. That's And that's when the last Gentile who needs to get saved gets saved. And so I believe at that moment, that's when the rapture can finally happen. It's when that last, that person out there, the, the last number in the, the fullness of the Gentiles, when that last person gets saved, then the fullness of the Gentiles will be complete. The church age will be done. Jesus will come get us. And then we go back, th- the clock starts again on God's plan for Israel. And that final seven years can begin. So anyway, when I said that God still wants to see a few more people get saved before the tribulation starts, that's what I was referring to. I meant to see it as in what God is wanting to have happen. It's, I'm not, I don't mean that God is up in heaven, just kind of like with his fingers crossed, <laughs> you know, hoping that enough people get saved. That's not what I meant. So sometimes I'm a little playful with my language, but I've always kind of wanted to do an episode on the fullness of the Gentiles idea. And anyway, I got, I guess I got to address it here. So that's what I was referring to. And then one, well, here's another feedback, and this might be where I kind of hone in the, the rest of my episode today. One common response, I get this all the time, is that the rapture was invented by John Nelson Darby. So before I talk about whether John Nelson Darby invented the rapture, first, let me, I just want to say this. This is why I've never looked into the issue before. Does it even matter whether he invented the rapture? That's the question I want to start with. Does that even matter? I want to talk about this because I've heard this accusation for years that I follow this John Nelson Darby guy. But I, even with all the accusations, I've just never felt inclined to go research whoever that is because it just doesn't matter to me. The, the complaint is in completely, it's, it's irrelevant to me entirely. I've never even heard of Darby other than the constant complaints. He is a 100% non-factor in my life. I would hope that we could have this discussion based on what God's word says, not what some guy in the 1800s says. Okay, here's why I say that. Would it be legitimate for a Catholic to complain that Protestantism was just invented by Martin Luther in the 1500s? Would that mean that Protestantism is wrong or false? Okay, and I do know who Martin Luther is. I'm thankful for Martin Luther. But I don't need to pull out a Martin Luther commentary to prove why I believe in salvation by grace through faith. I would never go say, well, I follow Martin Luther and here's what he said. I would not do that. I would pull out what the Bible, I would pull out the Bible and and show what the Bible says. So that's what I would say about the rapture. I would open up the Bible and let's look at what what it says about the rapture. I don't need the writings of some Darby guy. So it's not even relevant to me if it came from some guy named John Darby. If I were going to talk about Martin Luther, I wouldn't say that he invented the doctrine of salvation by grace. What I would say is that Martin Luther rediscovered that doctrine, or he he brought these truths out of God's word because they had kind of become lost to time. Okay, I would say salvation by grace through faith. It was always in the Bible. Martin Luther was just the guy who stood up and said, hey, 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 I think we've gotten off track from this doctrine. Like, let's clear this up. Let's look again at what God's word says. Let's look afresh. And and I would say, if you go back to the writings of the early church fathers, which is, I think that's a good thing to do. And if you look at especially what the Bible itself says, you see salvation by grace. You don't see indulgences. You don't see baptism by sprinkling. You don't see confessing your sins to a priest. You don't see all that stuff. These things were, you know, the truth was always there in God's word. But the religious systems of man had kind of made these truths go dormant for a while and kind of like lost to history. And then Martin Luther brought them back. And so that's just, I guess that's my initial impression when I hear people telling me that I follow some guy named John Darby, John Nelson Darby. Look, maybe Darby just rediscovered that truth in, of, of the rapture in God's word. And so I don't know yet. I haven't looked into John Darby yet. 
But how would I know that this isn't just a Martin Luther situation? That a lot of truths of the rapture had always been there in God's word, but they had just been lost or suppressed for whatever reason. And now Darby is rediscovering them and bringing them back out into the light. So that that seems plausible to me. That's why the objection that the rapture was never around until some guy named Darby told us about it, that objection's just never made sense to me on the face. It doesn't refute the rapture one iota, in my opinion. Okay, think about it this way. Maybe if John Nelson Darby didn't teach us about the rapture until the 1800s, maybe had God had allowed the rapture theology to go dormant for most of church history. Because for most of church history, the rapture wasn't something that they needed to concern themselves with. Why would God need Christians in the Middle Ages to be worrying about the rapture? Or looking forward to the rapture, we might say. They weren't going to need it. Okay? That wasn't relevant to their lives. Perhaps it's in these last days that God wanted us to learn about the rapture because we are the generation that needs to be ready for it. That makes perfect sense to me. So, get, here, here's the thing. Get ready to experience some time travel. I'm going to go take a short break. I'm going to go educate myself on John Nelson Darby. Okay, I'm going to go look up who this guy is. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you what I learned or what I think you need to know about this guy. And let's discuss whether this man actually invented the rapture. So get ready to experience some time travel. I, it's going to be, a, you know, a, a, a few hours maybe for me to do my research for you It's going to be instantaneous. Hang tight. We'll be back in a few seconds, and I'll tell you all you need to know about John Nelson Darby. Okay, I'll tell you what I learned about John Nelson Darby in just a moment. First, if you want to leave some feedback here, if you have a response to something I said, um, if you've already responded previously and and I responded today, and now you have a response to my response to your response, you can leave a comment or shoot me an email, crossreferencespodcast at gmail.com. And so the next time on this podcast, I'm going to be in Ezekiel 24, and we're just going to go back, keep going on our journey through that book. Ezekiel 24 is a big turning point in the book of Ezekiel. And so if you haven't been part of the journey so far, this is a great place to jump in because it's a big transition point of the book of Ezekiel. Make sure that you are subscribed so you can get a notification about that when that episode comes out next week. So let's talk about John Nelson Darby. What did I learn about John Nelson Darby? And I I tried to look at both pro and anti-Darby sources. It's hard to find anything that's unbiased these days. And so I tried to just do my best to... I, Wikipedia had a lot of what I considered to be unbiased commentary on who he was. So I know you can't always trust Wikipedia but that, I, I'm just saying that was probably the most, in this case, it was the what I considered the most reliable source. So John Darby is known as the father of dispensationalism. And as I've said before on my podcast, um, the fancy word that describes my views of the end times and how I kind of look at things in the Bible, that, that's called premillennial dispensationalist. And so you often hear if you hang around theology locations on the internet, dispensationalists will get a lot of hate. And the hate really doesn't make sense to me. (laughs) You know, if someone disagrees, I guess that'd be one thing. You hear a lot of outright anger, vitriol, you know, from other Christians for people who use dispensationalist thinking. What is dispensationalism? That's a way of dividing history. And it's a theological point of view. Wikipedia describes it this way, dispensationalism is a theological framework of interpreting the Bible, which maintains that history is divided into multiple ages or dispensations in which God acts with his chosen people in different ways. So dispensationalism is just a way of dividing history into different eras. Dispensationalism calls the time of Adam and Eve, back before they even sinned, it calls it the age of innocence. It calls the time period from Moses until Jesus the age of the law. It calls the current time period where we are now, from Jesus basically until today, it calls it the age of grace, or sometimes called the church age. So these are just labels that we use to talk about time periods. And if someone doesn't like the labels, if somebody wants to come up with their own labels or their own time eras, that's perfectly fine to me. (laughs) You know, to me, I don't care. 
It's like if you want to use the metric system or the English system whenever you're measuring something, fine. Okay, I use the English system because that's what I grew up with. That's what makes sense to me. If someone else wants to use the metric system, I don't get mad at them. I don't think it's good or bad. It's just a different way of measuring things. Okay, Fahrenheit or Celsius. I don't care. (laughs) Use whatever you want. But if you measure church history through dispensations, all of a sudden you're going to start getting a lot of hate, a lot of anger from your fellow Christians about it. I get it all the time. And I don't even understand it. (laughs) I don't know why they're getting mad at me. Okay, if you're against dispensationalism, if you want to, you know, educate me on what you think is a better way to kind of look at history, fine, go right ahead. My email, I gave it to you, crossreferencespodcast at gmail.com. Send it to me. I don't care. I'm not going to get mad about it. Maybe it'll make more sense to me after you explain it. Okay, you can send it to me through an email. Go ahead. Don't don't tie it through to a brick and throw it through my window. Just send me an email. You can be anonymous if you want. I would really like to know why some people get so mad about this. Okay, I so I've known about dispensationalism for years. I didn't know the name of the guy who came up with it. I guess it was John Nelson Darby. He's credited with coming up with it. And he's credited with coming up with the pre-tribulation rapture view. Another popular systematic theology book um, by an evangelical, it's called Evangelical Theology. It's by a scholar named Michael Bird. And he says, the pre-trib view did not appear on the scene of church history until John Nelson Darby in the 1830s. So let's analyze this. Did John Nelson Darby, did, it, did this rapture idea never exist in all of church history until he came up with it in the 1830s? Darby is this guy who lived from 1800 to 1888. He lived in London, England. He was a theologian. Um, he was seriously injured. I'm just telling you some of the history. He had an interesting story. He got thrown from a horse in 1827. And during his recovery, he began studying the Bible deeply. And he became convinced through his studies that the millennial kingdom of Christ was not talking about the current church of Jesus. That was a popular view at that time, that the church was the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Not that the millennial kingdom was some future time period, but that the church was the millennium right now. And so Darby went against that idea. He developed something that was called dispensationalism. He said that we are in the church age or the age of grace, but that there was a future time period or dispensation that was yet to come, and that this was called the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Okay? Now, I am no history expert. This is just me kind of doing a brief survey of Nelson's history. I mean, Darby, John Nelson Darby's history. I can't find anything scandalous about Darby, you know, saying that he lived some kind of wicked lifestyle, that he had some scandals associated with him, that he didn't really believe the gospel. To me, as I read read about him, he seemed like a devoted theologian for his entire life up until the day he died. And there's a lot of great men, great theologians that I disagree with on end times theology, both, I mean, both right now and, and in history. And yet I still love a lot of these theologians. They're brothers in Christ to me. So I don't, I don't understand as I look at John Nelson Darby's history, I don't understand why so many people have all this hatred and vitriol toward him. I mean, he, even if they disagree with him on end times prophecy, he seemed like a good man. <laughs> so I did, if you know something I don't about what makes him so dislikable, again, you got my email. Um, I can see from the, the listenership that there's a lot of you out there listening who don't like John Nelson Darby, okay? But if nobody expresses disagreement to me about his lifestyle, I'm just going to assume that he doesn't have a dark history, okay? I'm not seeing it when I do the research. You can correct me if I'm wrong. So I don't know why there's so much anger and hatred toward John Nelson Darby. Okay, let's finally answer the question. Did he invent the rapture? Okay, is it true that this is something he just made up and that it never existed as a doctrine until the 1800s. Well, I'm happy to say that this claim is not true. There are other places throughout church history that we see people talking about this idea of a tribulation period and a rapture before the end of the tribulation period. There was a theologian in the 1700s named Morgan Edwards. He's actually the guy who founded Brown, U- Brown University 
in Rhode Island. And Morgan Edwards wrote this, The dead saints will be raised, and the living changed at Christ's appearing in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, and this will be about three years and a half before the millennium. But will he and they abide in the air all that time? No, they will ascend to paradise or to some of those many mansions in my father's house that are referred to in John 14, and so disappear during the foresaid period of time. The design of this retreat and disappearing will be to judge the risen and changed saints. So Edwards is referring to three and a half. It's, it doesn't mean it, it, he was not a mid-tribulationist. He just he believed that the tribulation would only be three and a half years, not seven years. But And that's a reasonable interpretation, I think. But uh, I still think it's seven. But anyway, he said that because he believed in a rapture before the tribulation. So there's a theologian right there from the 1700s saying, I guess what John Nelson Darby said too. John Nelson Darby just said it would be seven years. That's the only difference. But they both believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. In the 1600s, there was a Boston Puritan named Increase Mather. He wrote, when Christ comes, believers shall see the king in all his glory and shall go with him to the land that is very far off. Heaven is the land that is very far off. And then Mather later, later said, Later they shall come down from heaven, they shall be with him when he comes to judge the world. So he had the idea that the Christians would be raptured out of the world before the end times periods. Also, another minister said similar things in the 1600s, named William Sherwin. In the Middle Ages, everybody believed in amillennialism. That means there was no millennium. This was before the Protestant Reformation. Catholicism ruled the day. It had many people not believing in a millennium at all. And yet, even in the Middle Ages, there were a group of Italian believers who believed that they would be raptured out of the world and spared the time period of the Antichrist, and that after all that, they would return to earth with Jesus. This is recorded in a book called The History of Brother Dolcino, which was written in 1316. So, there's another, ex- there's another example of rapture theology before John Nelson Darby. And then if we go all the way back to the time period of the first few centuries of the church, this is where we talk about what we call the church fathers, okay? These are the men who were the first New Testament pastors, New Testament theologians, the men who were taught directly by the apostles. What did they believe? Did they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Well, we have pre-trib rapture ideas that are expressed in the writings of a man named Irenaeus of Lyon, and he was a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John, as in the John who wrote Revelation, okay? So we have the writings of a man who was taught by Polycarp, who was taught by John. Uh, This man, Irenaeus, he lived in the 100s AD. He wrote a book called Against Heresies. And in this book, he referred to the rapture of Enoch as a picture of what will happen to the church. He wrote, this is a quote from him, For Enoch, when he pleased God, was translated in the same body in which he did did please him, thus pointing out by anticipation the translation of the just. Elijah, too, was caught up when he was yet in the substance of the natural form, thus exhibiting in prophecy the assumption of those who are spiritual and that nothing stood in the way of their body being translated and caught up. And then Irenaeus also wrote, And therefore, when in the end, the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, there shall be tribulation as has not been from the beginning, neither shall be. And that's Matthew 24, 21. For this is the last contest of the righteous, in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. So all those quotes right there. That's Irenaeus talking about The church is going to be raptured just like Enoch was, just like Elijah was, and that it's going to happen before all this tribulation comes upon the earth. Thank God for Irenaeus. (laughs) I mean that literally. He was writing this nearly 2,000 years ago. He was writing about a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, and he was comparing it to Enoch and Elijah. If you remember, a few months back, I had an episode called Seven Raptures in the Bible. I will link to it in the show notes. But I remember a few years, a few months ago when I did this episode, there was this Bible student who was writing me some angry messages telling me I only believed in the rapture because of John Nelson Darby, that it's nowhere in the Bible, that there's, I said, well, actually there's seven raptures in the Bible, 
And I said to her, if the rapture is not in the Bible, then what happened to Enoch? She got so frustrated with me about this. She said, nobody has ever described Enoch as being raptured before. She told me I was making that up on the spot. (laughs) And she told me she just wrote this big research paper uh, for whatever Bible college she was in. She had like 30 citations in the in her research paper. Her professor gave her an A. She was certain that nobody had ever referred to Enoch as a rapture before I did, that I just made it up right there. And and here Irenaeus is doing that 2000 years ago, one of the church fathers. <laughs> so anyway, I found that funny. And, and again, on that subject, there's another clear rapture in the Bible. Jesus, whenever he ascended into heaven. That was 40 days after the resurrection. That was a rapture. In fact, the word used in Revelation 12, as it described Jesus ascending to heaven, it uses the word harpazo. And the Latin word for harpazo is enrapturo. Harpazo is the same Greek word that was used in 1 Thessalonians to talk about the rapture of the church. And it was used again in Revelation 20 to talk about the rapture of Jesus. So yes, there are multiple raptures in the Bible starting with Enoch, it is, it is false, absolutely categorically false to say the rapture is something that John Nelson Darby made up in the 1800s. I would say perhaps he popularized it, okay? I see no evidence that John Nelson Darby read Irenaeus or one of those other theologians I mentioned before. I think he just studied the Bible and he saw the rapture there. He saw that all millennialism was wrong. And he trailblazed a new framework for understanding God's calendar and understanding where we are on God's calendar, just like what Martin Luther did for the doctrine of salvation by grace. John Nelson Darby did that on the doctrines of the eschatology of the church. He restored them after they had been lost to history. So I'm thankful for John Nelson Darby. And even if he was a nobody to you before today's episode, just like he was a nobody to me, but I hope you are thankful for him too. So um, there's there's my research project there on John Nelson Darby. And now I guess maybe I'll finally have something different to say when people accuse me of following him. I don't know. It's still kind of immaterial to me. It's still not really relevant to my life, but I guess I know a little bit more about the history here. And I'm glad I tuned in. I'm glad I I, uh, researched it. And I I hope you're glad too that you tuned in today. Thanks for tuning in to hear from a nobody like me Um, It is a true honor to get to spend a little bit of time studying the Bible, studying church history, studying theology, and then get to share what I learned with you. And so I hope it was time well spent for you. Um, If it was, you could show some appreciation by sharing this podcast with a friend or leaving a positive review. And again, make sure you're subscribed because um, I probably have got, I've got actually some more mailbag comments that I, I'm just going to save them for future episodes. I wasn't able to get through all of today what I wanted to talk about, but I'm sure you'd agree I've been talking long enough. So I'm going to end today by talking about another nobody that you've never heard of. His name was Danny Lewin. And I I love to share this story around September 11th. Um, I didn't get a chance to share it last week because I I already had an interview scheduled with a friend of mine for that day. So I aired that episode last week. I'll share my Danny Lewin story today. Danny Lewin was born in 1970. Uh, In 1979, his dad brought home a computer. And Danny found this, he found computers fascinating, started studying computers. 1984, the family moved to Israel. And so Danny spent his high school, his high school years learning about computers, mathematics. He joined the IDF, that's the Israeli Defense Force, and became very proficient and, you know, they're, they're, Israel is a very cutting edge nation when it comes to technology. And so Danny ends up moving back to America in the 1990s. He started an internet company and became very successful until the early 2000s. His company went under. He was going to have to, uh, to get up in the morning and fly from Los Angeles to Boston. He was going to have to meet with his executives out there. They're going to have to lay off a bunch of people. And so he's on the plane, right, flying out there. And as he's riding on the plane, he hears some people who are speaking a foreign language. And it was Arabic. Because of Danny's history with the IDF, he could understand Arabic. And he knew what they were saying. And he knew that he had to stop them. So he stood up to do just that. 
and they stabbed him to death right there on that airplane. These men were the terrorists who crashed the planes on 9-11. A lot of people lost their lives that day. Danny Lewin was actually the first. He was the first person to die on September 11th of 2001. Why do I tell that story? I want to say this. We never know how much time we have left. So, always be ready to go. Even if you don't believe in the rapture, okay? If you're still, if you're listening, you don't believe in the rapture, you think I'm crazy, that's okay. Hey, I still love you. You're a a brother or sister in Christ, I hope. And so, you know, I talk about this stuff because I love it. I'm passionate about it. But I also, I just want to always remind every Christian out there of this. Even if you don't believe in the rapture, there's still something else you always need to be ready for, and that is death, okay? It doesn't matter how old you are. You have no guarantees in this world. You have no guarantee you're going to be here five minutes from now. Anything can happen. You could slip and fall down the stairs. You could have a brain aneurysm. And the next minute, you're standing in the presence of Jesus. You're standing at the judgment seat of Christ. Guess what? I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm not trying to be a downer as I end here. I'm just saying, even if we disagree about the rapture, it, you think it could be now, you think it could be in 10 years, you think it, there's never going to be a rapture. There's still something we all got to agree on. We've always got to be ready to meet the Lord. Always be ready. Have all of your business on this planet taken care of because we never know how much time we have left. Thanks for listening to the Cross References podcast. This has been Luke Taylor reminding you what the old song says. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Oh, 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 oh,